Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 31st Virtual YMCA Education Series Program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I'm a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. We are recording this evening's presentation so that you will be able to revisit it again. Please feel free to tell your family and friends about it so that they too can visit it on either the IBJI or NSYMCA websites. Dr. Anthony Savino will be hosting tonight's program entitled Neurological Health, Improving Brain Health in Adults and Athletes. You are likely already aware that your brain is the most complex organ in your body. It underlies your ability to move, communicate, make decisions, problem solve, and live a productive and useful life. You're probably also aware that maintaining a healthy brain is critical in pursuing optimal health and longevity. Doing so, however, can be complex, especially when life throws us complications that impact our brains. Tonight, Dr. Savino will discuss the symptoms, causes, diagnosis, and treatment options available for some of the challenges that we face in keeping our brains healthy, including headaches, sleep issues, and traumatic brain injuries. Anthony Savino, MD, is a board-certified neurologist with fellowship training in sports neurology. He completed his residency in neurology at Boston University Medical Center, serving as chief resident during his final year of training. Prior to that, Dr. Savino obtained his medical degree from Rush Medical College in Chicago and his undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado Boulder. During his fellowship, Dr. Savino collaborated on a long-term research study of head trauma of youth and high school football players. The study examined the potential sequela of repetitive hits to the head over time through measurements of head impacts by helmet sensors and extensive brain function tests before and after each football season. His interests continue to focus on brain trauma, including the management of acute concussion, autonomic dysfunction in concussion, treatment of post-concussion syndrome, and post-concussion headache. In addition to focusing on concussions, Dr. Savino treats all neurological disorders, specializing in migraine and other headaches, sleep problems, mood challenges, pre-participation neurological evaluations, and long-term brain health in adults and athletes of any age. Dr. Savino's philosophy of care is that treatment needs to be personalized to each patient. He says that treatment is less about a protocol and more so a process. For example, Dr. Savino promotes concussion baseline testing in student athletes so that ba that baseline can be used to compare cognitive function if a concussion is suspected. He explained in a WGN TV segment on concussions that a concussion is a clinical diagnosis, which means that there is no one objective test or measure to make a diagnosis. Therefore, the more information the doctors have prior to an injury, the more information they will have to compare after an injury to make a proper diagnosis. Dr. Savino is a neurological consultant for the Chicago Red Stars professional women's soccer team, the Chicago Wolves professional men's hockey team, Lake Forest College, both Glenbrook North and Glenbrook South high schools, plus six other local high schools and some local sports club teams. He also serves as a team pool physician for the US ski and snowboard team, and he is on the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. It's a wonder he found time to speak with us this evening. Speaking of which, during Dr. Savino's presentation tonight, you might find that you have questions which he will be happy to address at the end of the program. When you have questions for Dr. Savino, simply type them into the question section on your screen and I will receive them and relay your questions to him. I ask that you please keep your questions general this evening as Dr. Savino will not be able to address individual concerns without individual consultation. If you do have self-specific questions, please co contact Dr. Savino via one of the options listed below now and which will be listed on the slide that will be shown during the Q&A portion at the end of this presentation. One last thing before I turn the evening over to Dr. Savino, I invite you to mark your calendars for Wednesday, September 28th at 7 p.m. for our next IBJI and NSYMCA Education Series program hosted by Dr. Leon Benson entitled Common Hand, Wrist, Elbow, and Shoulder Injuries, Prevention, Diagnosis, and Treatment. Thank you again for joining us this evening, and thank you, Dr. Anthony Savino, for your time and effort in putting together this program 
to help us understand neurological health, health and what we can do to improve the health of our brains. Now, Dr. Savino, please take it from here. Thank you, Karen. That was uh, incredibly uh, thorough and uh, maybe the nicest intro I've ever received, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to dive right in today. We have a lot to discuss. Um, as uh, Karen mentioned, the, the title is Neurological Health, Improving Brain Health in Adults and Athletes. Um, I certainly won't cover the, the breadth of uh, neurology today, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, um, whether related uh, to this or not, um, at the end. Um, so we'll get started. So I don't have um, any disclosures uh, related to this talk today. Um, some general goals uh, of the, of the uh, meeting today. Um, first, review ways uh, to optimize brain health. Um, we're going to look at some studies today, so a little bit scientific. Um, again, if there's any questions regarding specific studies, let me know. Um, but these are studies that are leading to uh, uh, neurological recommendations that we'll have today. And then we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive on, on sleep and mood tonight. Um, I know uh, Karen mentioned um, other disorders, including headaches. Again, happy to answer general questions regarding that at the end. So most of what I'm going to talk about today is based off of a pretty important study um, that was completed in uh, 2020. Um, uh, and this is from uh, the Lancet uh, Journal, uh, well-regarded journal. And uh, it looked at, uh, it was spotlighting dementia. Um, and, prime, and more importantly, what we can do to prevent dementia or improve outcomes in regards to dementia. And I don't think there's anything more important in regards to brain health uh, other than dementia. So we'll kind of talk about that. Um, this was an extension of a 2017 study that was completed, and they actually added uh, three additional risk factors that were noted. Um, and basically, this was, you know, a very, very comprehensive review of previous studies that were done, um, and they identified actually 12 risk factors that are modifiable um, uh, in dementia and account for estimated 40% of uh, dementia risk. So, you know, uh, it's fairly substantial. To take a step back, you know, what, what is this problem that we're dealing with? So at, at present, we have about 50 million people worldwide that are dealing with dementia. And that's expected, as you can see, uh, to triple over the next, you know, 25 years or so. Um, estimated global cost of about $1 trillion. Um, and, sorry, this panel thing is funny. Um, as we'll talk about in a second, um, early risk factors of dementia are thought to affect what's called cognitive reserve, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, um, while later risks, risks later in life, influence that reserve and also trigger um, neuropathological issues. So what is cognitive reserve? Um, there's different, differing definitions, but in general, um, it's the concept that accounts for a difference between individuals' clinical presentation and their anatomical pathology. Um, so a good way to explain this is, you know, uh, as we get older, we develop, we probably all develop to some extent, um, pathological changes in the brain, which may include things like uh, tau, you know, tau, which is uh, discussed in Alzheimer's or plaques, otherwise uh, known as. Um, However, we see that uh, if we look at individuals that ha have the same amount of burden of those problems in the brain, they could present in very different clinical ways. And some people might have full-blown you know, dementia presentation clinically, and other people might not have any issue at all. So that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. Why is that the case? Um, and we think that cognitive reserve, in addition to what we're talking about, is changeable by uh, education, um, things like occupational complexity um, and even leisure activities. And these are affected, this is affected both by early and late life factors. So let's kind of dive into this. So this is a schematic of, of what they presented in the paper um, uh, of things that you can uh, see that are uh, present or more prevalent um, throughout different stages of life. Um, and ultimately again, resulting in about 40% of modifiable risk factors in dementia. Um, I just want to highlight this this piece here. There is, you know, 60% that we relative are relatively unknown. So, you know, it's uh, 
fixing all these problems isn't going to take away risk 100 percent but again 40 percent isn't anything to sneeze at and i thought a very interesting point here was that genetics was only estimated to represent seven percent of risk now you hear a lot about you know genetics and alzheimer's genetics and dementia um and this is pretty incredible so you know a substantial uh a higher percentage is modifiable than comparable to genetics. So, you know, not all is lost, even if we have a genetic risk factor for um, dementia or Alzheimer's. These are the um, uh, items that are we're going to be talking about. Um, and again, this is all kind of to the tune of, uh, or the goal of doing the best we can to prevent or mitigate dementia um, or onset of dementia. Um, and we'll focus first on uh, you know, early life. We'll kind of go through this in stages. So what they highlight here is, is education. Um, their recommendation based on the information that they reviewed is, which seems kind of self-evident, provide all children with primary and secondary education. They found that uh, higher childhood education levels and lifelong higher educational attainment reduce dementia risk. And I think, you know, this is fairly well known, you know, that lifelong learning, um, continuing education, um, staying active mentally uh, is thought to reduce dementia risk. Um, and in assessment of uh, cognition over time, they found that ob obviously cognitive abilities increase with education, but interestingly that that kind of plateaus in late adolescence um, or early adulthood, you know, kind of in the college years. Um, and so it's really important and their focus is on early life education uh, because that seems most modifiable. Um, again, I said we're gonna talk about some studies. So, so here's the first one. Um, longitudinal studies in, in Chinese adults, over 15,000 subjects, so a lot of, a lot of subjects. They were looking at older individuals, 65 years or older, with a mean of 74. Um, they were dementia-free um, at the onset of the study. And they looked at um, the subject self-report of information regarding intellectual activities. And these included reading, playing board games, and interestingly, betting, um, like uh, sports betting. Um, and they found that, sorry, and I think you guys can see this too, so I'm just gonna try to move this. Um, a lower dementia risk was found in those engaged in any of these intellectual activities, and that was true even when they adjusted for other health behaviors, including you know, cardiovascular risk, diabetes, smoking, those sorts of things, um, physical and psychiatric comorbidities, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, obesity, and socio-demographic or e economic factors. So this seemed to be pervasive even through those other risk factors. And that's going to be a theme uh, of today is that um, you know, all these things are an individual risk, but obviously at the end, uh, they all kind of work in concert to some degree. Another interesting study, so uh, what we call prospective population-based studies. So we, we found a population and followed them over time, um, ages 65 to 95, a little bit smaller of a pool, 1600, again, dementia-free at onset, good, good follow-up, about 12 years or so. Um, and this was, I found this interesting. They found older age at retirement was associated with decreased risk, but not necessarily the number of working years. Um, and uh, they thought that this suggests possibly a psychosocial vulnerability factor. So it's not necessarily the time of, excuse me, the length of work, your working life, but, you know, and we've all, I think, a lot, again, a lot of people have heard this, when you retire, we start to notice some things, right? So um, this speaks to the fact that, you know, the longer we work or probably more so stay cognitively engaged, um, the better we're going to do. Um, then we'll move on to midlife. Um, and this involves several risk factors. We'll kind of go through these individually. So hearing, so maybe something you wouldn't really think about. So um, their recommendation, again, based on the, the studies and, and the information that they reviewed, was encouragement of hearing aids for hearing loss, um, and even before, to reduce hearing loss in the first place, um, by protection of ears from excessive noise exposure. So we know certainly that that can happen from occupational hazard, right? Working in factories, uh, uh, driving trucks, you know, being uh, uh, working as a roadie uh, for, a, for a van, those sorts of things. Um, uh, certainly 
Um, protective measures are, are present now more than ever, just like a lot of things, you know, safety is important. So um, whether it's um, ear, ear uh, plugs or earphones, um, but um, as with anything, pre preventing it from happening in the first place is better than trying to, to fix it when it's gone. Um, this was the highest associ factor associated with dementia risk in the 2017 study, which is, again, I think pretty interesting and probably not what you would think based on the other things that we're looking at. Um, and it was actually has been associated with volume loss, so structural uh, changes in the brain um, when, we, when we lose our hearing. Um, lastly, they've looked at several studies and they've shown increased risk uh, for dementia only in those with hearing loss that are not using hearing, hearing aids. So it doesn't necessarily seem to be the hearing loss itself, but the inability to hear, if that makes sense. So if we're able to bring that back, that seems to have a, a beneficial effect. So again, a little study here, 3,700 participants. Um, again, uh, mid to later life, 65 years or older. Extensive follow-up, 25 years. Um, and their, uh, their uh, important results were Again, increased risk of disability and dementia in those with hearing problems. In addition, they found an increased risk of depression, specifically in men who reported hearing problems. Um, and we'll talk about kind of the depression and mood link with, with uh, dementia and cognitive issues as well. Um, and again, that's where they kind of found the association um, was not as strong or not found with those that, that wore hearing aids. So again, a modifiable risk factor, whether it's prevention or treatment, um, that seems to mitigate the risk factor of developing cognitive problems. And again, that'll be another theme that I'll emphasize. These are things that we can manage or treat, um, if not outright prevent. Um, hypertension, also known as high blood pressure, very common. Um, their recommendation is uh, to aim to maintain a systolic blood pressure, so that's the top number, um, under 130, most importantly in midlife, uh, which they said was you know, anywhere from 45 to 65 years with a kind of median of 55 or 50. Um, hypertension or high blood pressure also is associated with reduction in uh, brain structure volume um, and what are called white matter hyperintensities. So, you know, maybe there's some people on, on this, uh, on this um, presentation that have had an MRI of their brain and they, they've had that scary term. Um, and, uh, and that's usually due to things like hypertension or, or diabetes. Um, and then again, an interesting point, they found that um, statin or, uh, sorry, I used a jargon uh, term here or, or uh, acronym, aspirin use in older individuals um, was not found to, to reduce dementia risk. And uh, the, 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 point, the focus really was on older individuals here, so you know, 75 or older, um, where again, probably the, the use of those medications has less utility because whatever is going on has probably kind of already set in. So um, you know, previously the recommendation would be to put everybody on a statin and aspirin, but really kind of deprescribing has been somewhat popular more recently. Um, and certainly not giving um, people medications that don't have any warrant to them. So um, uh, they didn't find any relation between statin and, or aspirin use and reduce uh, reduction of dementia risk. Um, where do we get these uh, recommendations? Again, um, study with 8,600 participants, um, measured blood pressure over multiple points. Um, again, around age 50 was uh, found to be the risk. Important other point here was this risk seemed to be independent, again, uh, uh, just like our, um, our previous recommendations, independent of other factors. Um, this was independent of what's called cardiovascular disease, so actually in, internal or uh, intrinsic disease of the heart. So that would be things like you know, plaques or blockages in the heart, um, those sorts of things, things that would lead to a heart attack. Um, so uh, high blood pressure and those things can be related, but actually they found an increased risk with high blood pressure, irrespective of cardiovascular disease. So again, um, important in its own right. Um, another study, this one very big, 50,000 participants. Um, I'm sorry, this was a meta-analysis, so they looked at 27 studies, so they collected a lot of people. Um, and again, with a focus on prevention or treatment, they found uh, medic any medication that you use to lower blood pressure has positive effects as long as you're below that number that's recommended and it doesn't matter what class of medication you use so as long as we can get to that number if it's medications that we need that's the most important thing 
Okay, big one right here, right? Alcohol. Uh, we always hear moderation, moderation, right? Everything in moderation. So what does that mean? So they kind of quantified this and it's gonna be a little bit hard to swallow, no pun intended, um, for some of us here. So they looked at um, what's called a cohort study. So uh, people that uh, use and people that don't, um, 9,000 participants, pretty good. Again, uh, 35 to 55 years old. And they found that um, interestingly, again, another interesting point, um, more than 210 milliliters per week which is not a lot, um, and or abstinent, complete abstinence of alcohol, so no alcohol, both increase dementia risk by 17%. So when you, know, you hear a glass of wine can be helpful, that's not uh, all that untrue, um, compared with 140 milliliters or less per week. So there seems to be a sweet spot with, with alcohol. Um, they didn't they didn't clarify what type of alcohol. So, you know, we always hear, as I said, you know, wine might be healthier than uh, other alcohols, but um, it seems to be more the quantity. Um, and complete abstinence, again, we don't have to avoid 100%. Um, okay, weight and obesity. So what is obesity greater than or equal to 30 uh, body, mass, body mass index, BMI? Um, again, not surprising, associated with uh, later life dementia. Um, looking at a meta-analysis here, again, a group of studies put together. They had seven what are, what are called randomized controlled trials, so that's the gold standard of studies, um, uh, meaning the treatment was randomized between groups and nobody knew what the treatment was. Um, and 13 longitudinal studies, they had 1,000 participants with a mean age of 50, and they found that um, uh, loss of two kilograms or more in those with a BMI of over uh, 25, so not that high, um, was associated with improvement in attention and memory. So even beyond the obesity, which was over 30, and beyond dementia risk specifically, they found that weight loss can improve our cognitive function. Go figure, right? So um, even in people that are, you know, not uh, obese or, or considered obese or super overweight, um, we can benefit from, from weight loss. Um, and again, that's probably multifactorial. We are eating better, we're losing weight, you know, that could be helpful. We're sleeping better, you know, so it's probably multifactorial, but, um, but this means even, you know, even if we're not at those higher ends, we can find benefit from uh, addressing our weight. Okay, my uh, my interest here. So, um, traumatic brain injury. So this is a risk factor, right? So a lot of stuff out in the media. Um, some of it's uh, supported. A lot of it's sensationalized. I'm sure there'll be questions regarding it. We'll we'll briefly kind of touch it on it today. So there seems to be a fairly clear uh, correlation between moderate and severe traumatic brain injuries and risk of dementia. Um, the Standard classification for uh, the rating system of that um, includes several factors, um, including clinical presentation or what's called the Glasgow Coma Scale. So how you're functioning when you present to the hospital, um, uh, duration of loss of consciousness, duration of amnesia, and imaging findings. Um, and it's ever changing. They're kind of about evolving on, on how they rate those injuries as we're learning more about functional, more functional injuries of the brain of which concussion or mild traumatic brain injuries was, would fall. Um, not unexpected, the risk of dementia or later life cognitive problems increases with the number of injuries and the severity of injuries that you have. So in a general sense, you know, what I say in my office, you know, we don't know everything, but getting hit in the head over and over again probably isn't good for you. Um, however, I'd like to highlight a couple studies here that are more on the positive side, and specifically for um, uh, mild head injuries, concussions, and repetitive head trauma. So um, this is a study out of uh, Wisconsin, um, and it looked a cohort study, again, people that played football and people that, and, um, and athletes that did not play contact sports. Um, from 1957, so back in the day when we weren't really cognizant of this injury, weren't really um, uh, treating it for sure, evaluating it appropriately. 
um, and 3,900 uh, participants, so pretty good um, number there. Um, and pretty interesting outcomes, um, again, in the face of all these things that we hear. So they did several evaluations, um, including cognitive evaluations, neuropsychological testing, and they found, at least at this point in time, no difference in cognitive performance between the football players and, and um, the normal controls. Um, and, I, and I should mention, these are football players that played through high school. Excuse me. So the majority of athletes. Um, they also found positively a lower incidence of depression in the football players and they found that football players were more likely to be physically active later in life compared to those um, that did not play football um, and we know that physical activity is beneficial to us in a lot of things that we're talking about it fights against obesity um, uh, cardiovascular risk factors again high blood pressure cardiovascular disease um, diabetes uh, cholesterol, you know, uh, mood disorders, all of those things. So um, this was actually a positive that they found. And another uh, study kind of echoed that. So this was a different cohort of high school football players, um, a range from 1946 to 1956. So again, right in that time where we, we weren't really uh, aware of these injuries. Um, and they compared these football players to students that didn't play uh, sports. So just regular students and the general population. Um, and they again found no significant difference between the groups um, for later risk of dementia and or uh, Parkinson's disease or ALS, which is another um, condition that we sometimes hear linked to football or sp uh, contact sports. So again, um, while we're still finding out a lot of information regarding um, both mild traumatic brain injuries and subconcussive trauma over time, repetitive head trauma, um, these are two studies that point to the fact that this doesn't tend to be a problem for the vast majority of people that are playing contact sports, you know, up and through high school, which again is, is most people. All right, so now we'll move on to, to later life. Let me just see, doing pretty good on time. Yeah, I'll kind of breeze, breeze through some of these because, you know, uh, not a lot of other information, but air pollution, not great for us. Um, they also added secondhand smoke. So these were both thought to be risk factors. Um, and these tended to be additive effects. Um, they look specifically at things like uh, particulate matter. So like um, uh, smoke inhalation, again, working in like factories, those sorts of things, um, working with um, chemicals, uh, asbestos, um, things like nit nitrogen dioxide and, and carbon monoxide. So, uh, you know, car exhaust. Um, not unsurprisingly, these things aren't great for us. All I can say is, you know, we can do what we can do. Um, and then if it's an occupational hazard or you're able to avoid it or mitigate it, then that's what we would do. Um, obviously, smoking is not good for us. We know this. Um, and important point here is um, smoking cessation or stopping smoking both from a lung perspective, but also from a brain perspective, can have reversal effects even later in life. So it's never too late to give up uh, or to quit. Um, there is some bias in studying smoking and dementia because smoking, as I mentioned, also has other risk factors for death um, and uh, even premature death before the age of dementia. So it's you know impossible necessarily to study those patients because they didn't reach a point where they could develop dementia. So there is a little bit of bias here. Um, again, highlighting a study, cohort study, study group of smokers and non, um, 46,000 men, so a huge number, over 60 years old. Um, and this is kind of to my point. So they looked at um, smokers that uh, stopped smoking for more than four years um, compared to those smokers who continued to smoke over that period of time. And they found a reduced dementia risk or reduced diagnosis of dementia over the subsequent eight years after they, they stopped. So that's pretty incredible. So even you know stopping for that period of time at eight, over the age of 60 can significantly reduce your, your risk of developing dementia. Pretty incredible. Um, physical activity, again, no brainer. We're more active. It helps with a lot of health uh, uh, benefits. Um, again, this is kind of a complex area to study um, because it's difficult to necessarily determine uh, the extent of the risk reduction and what's called re reverse causation. So are we active because we're healthy or are we healthy because we're, we're active? Um, but needless to say, you know, 
uh, exercise is, is healthy. Um, so we found that exercise is associated with decreased risk of dementia. The most compelling evidence seems to be for aerobic exercise, so cardiovascular activity versus static activity like um, weightlifting. Um, and uh, again, similar to weight loss and maybe in concert with that, um, exercise has also been associated with improvement in cognitive status in normal individuals, normal, and mildly, mildly cognitive impaired individuals. So kind of a precursor to full-blown dementia. So again, all of us can benefit um, from a cognitive standpoint from exercise, and it might even reverse or prevent or delay onset of dementia in those people that are starting to develop um, symptoms. Um, like, you know, for Alzheimer's, for example, you know, short-term uh, memory is something that tends to go first. Um, so never too late. Um, a study uh, focusing on this, so meta-analysis, again, group of studies, this time 11 of them. Um, they looked at uh, aerobic or re resistance and multimodal exercise. Um, uh, and again, they found aerobic exercise in particular um, seemed to benefit um, mild cognitive impaired um, patients or uh, participants. Um, okay, the big D, mood, um, depression. So again, bidirectional. Um, it's associated with development or risk factor for dementia, but it also can be a part of, of the syndrome of dementia. So again, uh, hard to suss out sometimes. Um, they found in this um, evaluation that even a single depressive episode that could be a risk factor for dementia, um, and it more it may be a more of a risk for um, late life depressive symptoms. Um, we're going to take, as I said, a little bit of a spotlight on mood here, um, and we're going to expand beyond kind of um, dementia a little bit, um, as we may may have. Uh, younger uh, folks on here, but or children. Um, so uh, anxiety disorders are common, uh, so are depression, um, and uh, it affects. And this is probably higher now after COVID. Up to 32% of adolescents from ages 13 to 18. Pretty incredible. At least a third. Um, on top of that, an estimated 31%, again about a third, experience uh, anxiety disorder at some point in their lives. Um, that doesn't mean we all have generalized anxiety. There are different types of anxiety disorders, but again, pretty high. This is a prevalent issue um, and something that I talk a lot, a lot about in my, uh, in my clinic. Um, in addition, um, major depressive episodes occur in about 13%, again, probably higher after COVID or during COVID in adolescents 12 to 17 um, and in 17% of adults. So anxiety disorders tend to be a little bit more pervasive, um, but again, this isn't um, you know, a small problem. Um, what is anxiety? You know, wh wh why do we use that word? So we know that worries and fears are natural, right? It's, it's part of our natural um, human nature. It's a protective mechanism. You know, I always kind of say uh, when we were on the, on the plains uh, of Africa, you know, uh, fighting for our meals and in the caves, you know, a sense of fear and worry and observation uh, was, was protective for us. Um, but when it becomes distress or impairs our functioning, that, that's when it becomes a disorder. Um, and that's true not for only for anxiety, but all things kind of that we talk about. Um, anxiety is associated with, in kids, with academic underachievement and school refusal. Again, some of you might be aware of this. Um, and uh, just like a lot of things that we're talking about, uh, uh, it, having it in uh, childhood or adolescence confers a risk in adulthood. So three times the risk of anxiety in adulthood if we, if we have it and don't address it as a, as a kid. Um, it's also an increased risk for a secondary anxiety disorder. So, uh, excuse me, for a secondary anxiety disorder or depression, ADHD, uh, language disorders, learning disabilities, substance abuse, and suicide. Um, that being said, there's good prognosis and good treatments out there. Um, and those include things like psychotherapy and or medications. Um, you know, definitely with kids, of course, I'm not a pill pusher, right? It doesn't benefit me other than getting people to feel better. We always suggest psychotherapy or, or that sort of conservative management first. But uh, a lot of people do benefit from medications, whether short or long term. Um, why do people have anxiety? So this is a complex interaction between biological, psychological, and psychosocial factors. Um, this can start in infancy, and we see that infants can be what's called behavioral inhibited, 
um, and display these uh, these reactions um, even you know in, in infancy or very young. Um, there's also a significant learned component to this, um, uh, meaning that uh, we are who mm, we are who we are surrounded by, right? Nature versus nurture, um, and uh, so we see that this tends to run in, in families and can be um, uh, you know passed on um, not only genetically but behaviorally from parents to kids. Um, we'll kind of skip through this. There is a genetic predisposition about 30 to 50 percent. Um, and here I outline this in bold. So parenting is important. And, and again, if, if you're an anxious or have anxiety as a parent, um, this can, uh, this can uh, be um, transferred onto your kids. So things like feeling anxious or displaying anxious behavior, being overprotective, um, allowing kids low autonomy. So, you know, we, we need to allow our, our kids to kind of do their own thing at, uh, to a certain degree. Um, feeding into child's fears and anxiety. Um, or mistreatment, obviously, of, of the kid. Um, how do we? How does this happen? So direct negative experiences. Um, so you know, uh, as I said, uh, uh, feeding into the um, uh, child's fears or having you know just a, a traumatic or negative experiences as a child. Um, false alarms, so overreaction uh, or vicariously, again, as a, as a kind of a learned behavior. Um, this doesn't, you know, your kids or children aren't always going to come in and say, I'm anxious or I'm worried. It presents in other uh, ways. So avoidance, including school, a lot of somatics, what we call somatic symptoms, physical symptoms, commonly headache and stomach aches, um, dramatic responses to pain or injuries, commonly sleep problems, which we'll highlight as well. Um, excessive need for reassurance, again, feeding into their worries, um, poor performance at school. Um, if it's severe, you know, expl explosiveness and irritability or oppositional behavior, eating problems, anorexia. Um, so a lot of different ways that anxiety can present, um, not just worry. And we are talking a little bit about athletes today. So let's talk about that. You know, just like uh, non-athletes, athletes have anxiety. Um, a lot of athletes have what's called state anxiety, meaning in slight anxiety or nervousness about their sport or performance, but it doesn't permeate into their life. Um, a study looking at uh, these types of athletes um, found that um, social anxiety was correlated with avoidance in individual sports, interestingly, not team sports, um, which kind of is counterintuitive. Um, and social anxiety was not correlated with the level of, of competition necessarily. And uh, there's a couple of theories out there about anxiety in athletes or worry. Um, and uh, basically it's kind of an inverted U uh, function. So as I mentioned, some form of stress, worry and awareness is beneficial and protective and probably helps with performance. Um, so right in the meat of that curve is where we perform the highest. If we don't have enough of that, or if we have too much, it tends to affect us negatively. And you can, ex you can expand this to just life in general, but um, this is looking at athletes. We also find that uh, a poor stress response or worry can actually increase risk of injury and, and affect their rehab. Um, uh, there's also a positive relation between the perception of injury risk and injury recurrence. So a little bit of manifest destiny. So if we're worried about getting injured all the time, we may actually put ourselves at increased risk. And this is important when I send people back to sport after concussion, um, we do talk about what worries there might be getting back into sport. Because if you're changing the way that you operate and function, especially with contact sports or higher risk sports, um, that puts you, uh, that sets you up for uh, increased risk going back, not only from a head perspective or brain perspective, but for any injury. Um, when we get a, uh, an athlete back, we typically tend to focus on physical return, not psychological readiness, which again, I, I uh, impart on my athletes. Um, we talked about that. Um, things that can contribute, lack of athletic identity when they're out of their sport, feeling isolated and, and having pressure external, whether external or internal to return. And we often don't send athletes for psychiatric evaluation or, or treatment, um, which is a big part of concussion management or can be. Um, 
And as uh, Karen mentioned, doing preseason evaluations, I think is very important, again, especially from a brain perspective. Um, and that should include mental health because we know that um, those athletes with mental health conditions tend to do poorer um, after concussions or head injuries, both in their symptom presentation and in their recovery. Um, and I think I need a little, pick it up a little bit here. Um, so uh, again, a study just highlighting um, stress or anxiety disorders and risk of neurodegenerative diseases. So not just, um, not just um, depression. Um, so their definition of stress disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder and acute stress reaction, which is kind of the, the uh, uh, precursor to post-traumatic stress disorder within a month of a stress reaction is called a acute stress react or an injury is called a acute stress reaction, um, adjustment disorder, or other stress. And they found um, there was an increased risk. Um, uh, interestingly, highest for vascular dementia, um, not Alzheimer's or otherwise, um, but no association with Parkinson's disease or ALS. All right. Um, Social, so uh, social, less social contact, increased risk. Again, kind of speaks to being active. Um, uh, sorry for uh, those uh, not married individuals, but there is increased risk in single and widowed individuals as compared to married people, as married people in general tend to have more interpersonal contact than those. Than those. Um, and uh, this just kind of highlights those. Um, they looked at one of these studies looked at a five point scale. You can see here marital status. So we talked about that, but also family member support, contact with friends, community groups and paid work, interestingly, versus um, uh, volunteer work. And they found the higher score. So the, the more that these people participate in these activities, um, the decrease the risk. So that makes sense again. Uh, but it's not just marital status. Um, and they found up to a 40 percent. 46% difference in the highest group versus the lowest. So again, another important um, uh, risk factor there. Um, social isolation, diabetes, not gonna highlight, you know, go over this too much, but um, optimization of diabetic management is, is what is recommended. Um, obviously the longer and the more severe it is, the worse it, uh, risk it is or the higher risk it is. Um, as opposed to hypertension or high blood pressure, it, uh, it, oh, excuse me, similar to hypertension, high blood pressure, it's unclear if there's any specific medication that would decrease the risk. So again, the glucose number or the sugar number is the most important thing, not necessarily the medication you're on. Diet, again, pretty self-evident. Um, they've looked at a lot of different kinds of diets. Um, there's actually not 100% good evidence on one specifically, but as you would imagine, a healthy diet in general or eating healthy is better for you. Um, they did focus on two uh, diets that they recommended could um, be a, a modifiable risk factor, specifically in those people with cardiovascular disease, um, and that's Mediterranean and Nordic, um, which are somewhat similar. Um, and again, focused on healthy eating in general. Um, so that's what I would recommend, not just um, any specific diet. Um, and this focuses on uh, uh, those eating greeny leafy green leafy vegetables had less cognitive decline. Um, I would like to highlight this. This is another area of hot topic, vitamins, supplements, et cetera. Uh, bottom line, nothing's gonna save you, okay? Unfortunately, um, it's not a replacement for your diet. Um, getting your vitamins and minerals through your diet is way more important and valuable than getting it through a supplement. Um, and they looked at all these as I, I listed here, and they found there is a lack of evidence for any of these um, uh, helping to any significant degree. So um, as we say, sometimes, uh, unless there's a deficiency, um, you don't necessarily need to replace it. Um, you might just be uh, uh, paying for expensive urine, unfortunately. All right, um, we'll kind of go through this. This is just saying essentially that combining risk factors um, or excuse me, combining treatment of these risk factors is important. A lot of things we talked about, smoking, diet, activity, cholesterol, um, blood sugar. So we'll kind of go through that. And I know I'm getting there. I'll just uh, highlight a couple other things. Um, so sleep is ever, ever, ever important. We're learning, you know, every week I, I see a new study um, regarding sleep. Um, and we'll talk about what, what that means a little bit. So um, sleep disturbance is linked to all these bad things. So beta amyloid, as I was talking about with Alzheimer's, 
um, what's called uh, glymphatic clearance. So that's a thing that's been discovered recently. Essentially, it's the cleaning out of the of these bad things during the night. Um, we know that sleep poor sleep leads to uh, inflammation and cardiovascular disease. Um, interestingly, again, both too much, too little, and too much sleep is associated with increased risk. And we'll talk about uh, kind of where the sweet spot is. Um, they also found that sedative hypnotic, so certain sleep medications, are also associated with risk regardless of the amount of sleep. So um, using a medicine to get that amount of sleep might not be the best thing either. And again, there's reverse causation here. Dementia can also present with sleeping too much. This is just an example of the glymphatic system. We don't have to look at that. Um, and we'll kind of talk about sleep. So sleep's important. What are our recommendations? So um, uh, here's our sleep update. So these are ages, six to 12, nine to 12 hours. Here's my sweet spot, and, and teenagers are, are, are very uh, impressed at hearing this. Um, between ages 13 and 18, you need eight to 10 hours. Um, and beyond 18, we say seven or more um, previously. Now we really know that closest to seven is the best. So we're gonna um, talk about why that is. Um, all of our kids, all of your kids or any kids are sleep deprived. Um, so 60% of adolescents say they sleep less to, than seven hours on the weekdays. I consistently hear less than six. Um, so that is a big, big problem. And we know that short sleep is associated with all sorts of things, not just um, problems. Um, we'll kind of go through this a little bit. Not that important. Um, here, um, as we um, as we age, we sleep less, so we know that. We also need less sleep. Again, as we're talking about getting older, um, we're really kind of talking around the seven hour mark. Um, why is sleep important? We know that it's uh, low, poor sleep is associated with lower academic performance. Um, this isn't gender specific, so both uh, males and females. Um, obviously, going to bed later uh, leads to a worse outcome. Um, also, a bad routine um, leads to an outcome, a bad outcome. And it's again not only associated with cognitive or you know um, uh, physical conditions, but problems with attention, behavior, learning. Um, motor vehicle accidents, so that's a big one, especially with um, uh, young men. Um, risky behavior and mood issues. Athletes tend to sleep better than non-athletes. Um, uh, sleep is significantly affected by the training schedule, tends to be worse on days um, before training. Um, and uh, good sleep is associated with good performance. Um, poor sleep is linked to increased risk of injury. And I just want to highlight how we look at this. So how do we do it? We screen for the sleep disorder. We look at mental health. Um, we uh, Sleep journal can be helpful. Um, sleep hygiene and uh, looking at things that are, um, are detrimental to our sleep. And we'll talk about that. Um, what do we look at? Um, not just insufficient sleep. So the schedule, the quality, are we sleeping during the day? Are we tired during the day? Um, and uh, we can screen for that. Um, simple uh, acronym is BEARS. So looking for bedtime issues, trouble getting to sleep, staying asleep. What is our sleep hygiene? Are we excessively daytime uh, tired? Are we waking at, at night? Um, are we waking up during the night? And are we snoring? Um, Okay, so uh, what do we look at with um, problems with sleep? So uh, history from arrival home to bedtime is important. So we need to know all the information. Um, a lot of sleep issues are behavioral, uh, especially with young kids. I don't wanna go to sleep. Um, screens are detrimental. Both the light um, have a negative effect and the activity that we're looking at. Um, Late exercise, although we think exercise and physical activity is good, can be detrimental. Um, it keeps us awake. Um, this is a big one, our sleep environment. So what does our bed um, room look like? Um, do we do our homework in there? Do we uh, play video games in there? Do we play with our friends in there? That's a stimulating environment. If we're having problems with sleep, we wanna take all of that out and just um, use the bedroom for sleep. Um, how do parents respond to that? Um, are we feeding into it? Um, and is there an actual sleep problem or disorder? Um, let's uh, skip ahead a little bit, I apologize. Um, how do we evaluate for sleep issues? 
history, history, history. So you have to talk to the patient. What are the problems? Uh, a lot of the times, especially with youngsters or even with um, older individuals, it's a sleep hygiene problem. We're not setting ourselves up for sleep. Um, with kids, we want to talk to their parents. Um, we want to get a sleep diary and information. If we need to get a sleep study, if we're worried about snoring like sleep apnea, um, which can be uh, um, obstructive from things like tonsils or uh, if we're you know, overweight, um, and there's other tests that we can do. Um, how do we manage this? Lifestyle changes. So they're difficult. Um, and there's a lot of information coming out that if we have sleep problems when we're younger, just like anxiety, we're more likely to have sleep problems when we're older. And one of our studies that we'll look at highlight that. So it, it pays to fix these things or address these things when we're younger. So consistent schedule, even on the weekends, is recommended. I know, tough one, even for us uh, 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 older individuals. A bedtime routine. So again, no screens, no phone, something relaxing. Um, avoid sleeping uh, during the day. Um, that takes away our drive to sleep at night. Um, I talked about that. Um, screens. Um, clock watching. So a lot of times people with trouble sleeping are staring at the clock and worrying about what they're going to do when they can't fall asleep. Um, so we say if you're able to and the household allows it, get out of bed and do something and come back when you're tired. Start to associate that bed with sleep. And again, timing of exercise and uh, caffeine. How do we manage this? Otherwise, cognitive behavioral therapy and sometimes we use medications. So a couple of studies, I'm almost, I'm almost there. I know I'm a little bit over and I'll answer all, all the questions. Um, so uh, this looked at uh, uh, children and uh, adolescents, um, about half of which were uh, females. Um, and they found, uh, again, bi-directional association, not unsurprisingly, between depressive symptoms and disturbed sleep. So those that were uh, more depressed had disturbed sleep and vice versa. Um, and this showed a window really between five and 12 years for those sleep interventions. So again, attacking this problem early is gonna lead to a better outcome. Um, this looked at insomnia. This one did find um, it was more common in young women um, in adolescents um, compared to uh, what I had mentioned earlier um, and a 10% lifetime incidence about, uh, among uh, adolescents. And again, comorbid with psychiatric disorders. This was also found independently to be a risk factor for things like suicidality and substance abuse. So again, sleep is, is important. Um, they found risk factors for insomnia, screen use, obviously, caffeine, and stress. What was protective? Non-tech bedtime routine, reading a pure, you know, like a print a book or something like that, doing something relaxing, uh, meditation, and you guys can, uh, parents can, uh, uh, tout this one, time with spent with family. Um, and again, that's probably because they're not using their screen or their phone or, or doing otherwise engaging activities. Um, okay, so this really gives us our timeline um, or our duration. So this was a study, 28,000 participants. Um, they looked at what's the optimal time and they found the highest risk for later life cognitive problems was sleeping less than four hours or more than 10. Um, compared to those at sub seven. So seven seems to be really the sweet spot there. Um, this we know, this we know. So here's looking at all our risk factors that we talked about. Um, just like 2017, hearing loss seemed to be the highest risk factor. So again, pretty interesting. Um, the second was education, less education, and the third was smoking. So um, of the modifiable risk factors, those seem to be the, the highest risks um, individually. Um, so how do we put this all together? So again, at least 40% of dementia risk seems to be somewhat modifiable. You know, it's, I'm not saying we can prevent all these conditionings, conditions from happening, right? Some people have a predilection for high blood pressure or diabetes or those sorts of things, um, but we can optimize them. Um, creating an early cognitive reserve with education, maintaining that is the goal. It is never too late to start living healthier. I think I highlighted that with several of the risk factors. Um, one of our uh, deep dives, so sleep is becoming ever more important. Again, it seems that seven hours is the sweet spot for uh, uh, older individuals. Um, and, uh, and really focusing on sleep hygiene, hygiene and getting that sleep naturally is important. Um, and then, as we always talk about, everything in moderation. And that's what I have for today. Those are my references, and I appreciate it.
Thank you very much for the opportunity. Awesome, thank you. Uh, this, this was fantastic. And um, we do have some questions, but not too, too many. So uh, okay. I will start with, um, let's, let's start with sort of your overall with regard to dementia. Um, someone uh, mentioned that they have a serious sleep problem and will this lead to dementia later in life? Um, okay, well, uh, so as we, as we kind of highlighted, that might've been before the, the sleep section, um, we know that sleep uh, conditions are a risk factor. Um, and there's a lot of, I didn't highlight everything, but there's a lot of different issues you can have with sleep that might be a risk factor or modifiable. So I focused on um, duration. Um, so we know that again, seven hours, at least right now, seems to be the sweet spot. So sleeping more necess isn't necessarily better. Um, and certainly sleeping less, we can all agree that we probably know that. So um, if, in terms of duration, so seven hours seems to be the, the, um, the highlight. Um, how to get there, again, sleep hygiene is most important. I know that that doesn't fix every problem. You know, not using your phone at night isn't gonna miraculously make you sleep better. Um, but it is something that you, it takes practice. So these are things that you need to do t day over day and night over night to get good at, just like you would practice a skill. So even, uh, you know, with adults, I say, there's always time to learn. So routine schedule, um, as I'm, all those things I kind of mentioned. Um, and then outside of, of that, you know, we have things like sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is, is an independent risk factor probably for later life cognitive issues. Um, basically what sleep apnea is, is loss of you know, blood flow or oxygen to the brain when we're sleeping. Again, not good. Um, so if we have sleep apnea, um, obstruct, obstructive sleep apnea, we need to treat it with the CPAP. You know, we need to treat whatever the, the issue is. Um, and then lastly, um, we need to be aware of what medicines we're taking, you know, so again, the natural route or, or, or lifestyle modification route seems to be the best. Some people need medicines, you know, it, it's kind of a, a risk benefit scenario, um, but, uh, but uh, uh, limiting our use of those medications that seem to be a risk factor, what are called sedative hypnotics, um, uh, would be advisable as well. Okay, thank you. And, and how about the type of sleep? Uh, you know, um, someone wrote that they wear a Fitbit and they get mostly uh, light sleep versus REM sleep, uh, but they still might be sleeping seven hours. Does does that does the type of sleep or, or the, the quality of sleep? I'm not sure whether that actually is quality. Um, does that impact um, dementia? And is that something that someone can train or control to figure out a way to sleep more deeply? That's a really good question. And yes, it does matter um, seems to matter um, both with um, the things we're talking about today with you know risk of dementia and um, kind of just um, quality of life you know so um, I'll, I'll see a lot of individuals and again I deal most commonly with um, head injuries or, or mild traumatic brain injuries and oftentimes there will be sleep, sleep disruptions after those injuries not only trouble sleeping but also not attaining quality of sleep um, and that's where you're uh, unconscious, but you wake up and you're tired and you're kind of sleeping surface level. So kind of what um, this person is describing. Um, so uh, we are aiming for deep sleep and REM sleep. So that's what we want. So deep sleep helps us to rest and feel rested. Um, and REM sleep does seem to have a specific risk factor itself for possibly um, having, a, uh, creating, a, excuse me, uh, being a risk factor for later life cognitive issues or, or dementia. Um, so again, I would kind of go back to what I just talked about, focus on um, sleep hygiene, making sure our schedule is routine. Um, we're setting us up, ourselves up for successful sleep with our nighttime routine. Any of those things can um, disturb our sleep. Things like caffeine, um, substance use like alcohol, certainly medications, um, uh, our level of physical activity, those all can uh, also contribute to our level of sleep, uh, or excuse me, our stages of sleep um, and our, our attainment of, of deep sleep. Um, so those would all be things to kind of aim for. Um, you know, sometimes we do use medications to, to achieve quality sleep or deep sleep. Again, it's not, it shouldn't be the first thing that we look at. Um, we should modify all those other things that we can. Um, but even in, again, in, in the face of, uh, or management of concussion or, or head injuries, I sometimes use medications to, to get uh, 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 better quality sleep. 
Okay, got it. So maybe that person might it might be recommended to come see you and kind of go through and figure out what they can do to yeah, help improve their sleep. Okay. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Um let's see. Let's go talk a little bit more about concussion. How detrimental are screens to brain recovery after a concussion? Is it important to avoid them? Good question. Very popular question. Um, and actually, a couple studies just came out looking at this. Um, but I'll say, kind of backing up, the the big, well, one of the difficulties with um, assessing mild head injuries or mild traumatic brain injuries, which I'll use synonymously with concussions, um, and managing them is that this is a clinical evaluation at this point in time. So there's no one objective test to confirm or refute the diagnosis. It's different than like a broken bone or a blood disorder where you have a test and it's a yes or no. Um, uh, certainly that being said, there's cases that are more straightforward that you know loss of consciousness, amnesia, confusion, it seems pretty evident. But the vast majority of head injuries or, 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 or head injuries that are diagnosed as concussions do not involve those things. So that's kind of number one. So as we're talking about recovery or prolongation of injury or recovery, we're, we're also talking about clinical presentation, symptoms. We're not talking about following in the injury itself. So in these studies even that we're looking at screens or sleep or back to school or whatever it might be in terms of recovery, we're really looking at symptomatic recovery. So I think that's important to kind of clarify. Um, with that being said, there are some studies that have come out recently that have purported that using excessive screen use in the acute period after concussions or head injuries followed by neurological symptoms can lead to longer recovery. Um, in my experience, um, just as I talked about today, everything in moderation tends to be okay. And we need, the important thing with concussion, especially with <clears throat> the youth, is we need to balance their normal life, which unfortunately at this point involves a lot of screen use, Right. with management of their injury and their symptoms um, and uh, completely removing screens from it, um, young people can also have a detrimental effect in and of itself um, right. both from an academic pers perspective but from a social perspective as well probably more so so i my recommendations are okay in the first 24 to 48 hours let's lay off the screens excessive screens we don't need to be playing video games we don't need to be on the phone on, on snapchat for six hours certainly we don't need to do those things if we can't look at a screen and do our homework um, but that's more of a family discussion um, but after that I, we start to kind of reintroduce it again because we want to get them back to normal not that we right. necessarily want them to be looking at screens um, but uh, if you come up with a plan, you know, 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off, and slowly increase that, um, in my experience, again, patients tend to do fine, and they get that benefit from those other aspects, social and academic. So it's kind of a nuanced thing, um, and in my opinion, I don't think that um, using a screen is harming you in any physical way, in physiological way, um, <clears throat> but it can certainly exacerbate symptoms that you're experiencing. Okay, great, thank you, that was a very, Hearty explanation that that made a lot of sense, at least to me. So thank you. Okay, and I thought this was a good question too. I hope you agree. They recommend they you doctors recommend baseline concussion testing for athletes. Can anyone request to have this test? And this person feels like everyone should have one as part of a physical at some point in their life. I like that. Um, that's good. And uh, and. Yes, yeah, so to speak to baseline, yeah, so baseline testing has become very popular because of sports, obviously, and um, those, um, uh, because those are the people that are, you know, I guess, not in a general sense, in a, in a population-wide sense, putting themselves most at risk for head injuries, right? I mean, obviously, people do things like, um, uh, you know, ski or go water skiing, you know, there's other risk factors, walking down the street um, right. for normal people, but this is obviously a high population of, of youth um, and an area that of focus of research, obviously, as well over the past several years. So um, baseline testing in a general sense means um, information gathered before 
the season or before a possible injury that can be then compared um, to their performance after an injury to make a, a diagnosis, as you aptly uh, mentioned um, on the intro. And that can include things like cognitive evaluation, including, including computerized testing, which is the most popular baseline testing, um, but, also, and, but also other physical things like balance, um, a, a common test that we use to evaluate in concussion is eye, a specific eye movement test, um, so we can do that. Um, and, and almost as important, or maybe more importantly, in my opinion, um, are a lot of the things that we talked about here today, evaluating how that um, athlete's mind and brain operate on a day-to-day -day basis. And are there any underlying neurological or psychological conditions, things we talked about like here today, headache disorders, oh, sorry, did not focus on that, headache disorders, sleep disorders, mood disorders, um, that number one, have not ever been discussed or recognized, which is very common in my office. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, you know, mom turns to her, her child, I didn't know you have headaches four days a week, you know, boom, okay, wow. we'll talk about that. Um, or are not optimized and may put that athlete at risk for, again, a worse outcome after a, um, a concussion or a, or a head injury. Um, it also gives me, as I was saying, an opportunity to talk to those athletes and their families about those problems that might be going on. So to the point of kind of circling back to the question, um, again, sorry, very verbose, but um, I think maybe that's what would be most relevant uh, to those individuals maybe not involved in activities at high risk or, or you know increased frequency of risk but just normal individuals is is a discussion about neurological brain health kind of things we talked about today and right. identifying areas that may need to be optimized and you know if there they, there is a head injury again normal life happens or or you know we're engaged in extracurricular activities that are at risk um, we can use that information to evaluate the the injury and optimize their treatment afterwards so there are more cognitive types of tests and otherwise that are coming out for general use as well um, i wouldn't say that it's widely used but um, i'm definitely in, in favor of that and that that was a great point and a great question yeah great great i thought so too okay um i'd like to circle back to the information about the um supplements and okay. someone put in a question um what about those Prevagen ads? Have you seen those on TV where they where they've got you know it, it's more anecdotal. It's not a doctor, but it's someone saying, "Oh, I've I think it's helped my brain." Yeah. So, um, well, I'll say a couple things there. Um, one would be first would be the power of suggestion is powerful, um, and uh, which we kind of call the placebo effect. Right. Um, and uh, I'm not, uh, and I'm not saying that's a negative. I actually think it's a positive, and we use it a lot in medicine. Um, and I think it speaks to the power of the mind, actually. Um, and I do believe, to some extent, mind over matter, right? Um, if we, you know, we can manifest certain things. Not saying we can prevent dementia just by thinking about it, but um, we can um, we can help ourselves by thinking positively about things and approaching things in a positive way. So that's what I'll say first. And then um, specifically, I would say that, you know, what they looked at in this study did not involve that necessarily, that product, right? So I can't speak exactly to that. Um, mm -hmm. But what I would say is that um, we, uh, from a dementia perspective, we certainly don't have a cure for dementia, right? So uh, uh, we, can't, we can't fix it once, you know, Alzheimer's and those things kind of sit in. Uh, set in, we can't reverse the process necessarily, but we can mitigate it. And we can, as I was talking about um, today, look at these risk factors and modify our risk for developing it primarily, right? So um, those are the things that I would kind of focus on. Um, I guess I don't have a specific example for, or excuse me, answer for uh, Prevagen exactly. Um, but what I would say is that it doesn't seem to be the answer that, you know, everyone uh, might say it is. Um, it's not in any of our guidelines that are recommended, you know, for treatment of, of that issue necessarily. So um, I would, from my perspective, I would focus kind of on the things that we talked about today. Great, great. Well, thank you. That's, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. And like everything else, there is no magic pill. 
it, it takes some effort, it takes some work in your whole life to try to to try to improve your sleep, improve your uh, nutrition, improve your exercise, et cetera. Right. So, uh, Dr. Savino, thank you so much for your time. We've kept you late and I apologize for that, but I really appreciate you taking the time to answer the questions, taking the time to give us so much good information and really, um, you know, we know that a doctor's, uh, your, your knowledge comes a lot from these studies that you research and uh, sharing all of that with us is really helpful to even us lay people to understand, wow, they, they're really caring and they really want to go out and find information for us. So thank you so much for finding it all, sharing it with us tonight. Um, we hope to see you again. I know you did number six and now number 31. Uh, so thank you so much for the presentation tonight and for your, for your time and effort going into it. Have a great night, everybody. And again, thank you, Dr. Savino. Thank you so much for the opportunity and happy to come back anytime. Appreciate it. Terrific. Thank you. Take care. Good night.